I messed up. I hit the wrong button. This is now a two-part video because I'm me and I messed up. In the summer of 1952, Jones was hired as student pastor to the children at the Somerset Southside Methodist Church, where he launched a project to create a playground that would be open to children of all races. Jones continued to visit and speak at Pentecostal churches. Excuse me. While serving as Methodist student pastor, in early 1954, Jones was dismissed from his position at the Methodist Church, ostensibly for stealing church funds. Though he later claimed he left the church because its leaders forbade him from integrating blacks into his congregation. Around this time in 1953, Jones visited a Pentecostal latter rain convention in Columbus, Indiana, where a woman prophesied that Jones was a prophet with a great ministry. Jones was surprised by the endorsement, but gladly accepted the call to preach and rose to the podium to deliver a message to the crowd. Pentecostalism was in the midst of heal the healing revival and latter rain movements during the 1950s. Believing that the racially integrated and rapidly growing latter rain movement offered him a greater opportunity to become a preacher, Jones successfully convinced his wife to leave the Methodist Church and join the Pentecostals. In 1953, Jones began attending and preaching at the Laurel Street Tabernacle in Indianapolis, a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church. Jones held healing revivals there until 1955 and began to travel and speak at other churches in the latter rain movement. He was a guest speaker at a 1953 convention in Detroit. The Assemblies of God was strongly opposed to the Latter Rain movement. In 1955, they assigned a new pastor to the Laurel Street Tabernacle who enforced their denominational ban on healing revivals. This led Jones to leave and establish Wings of Healing, a new church that would later be renamed People's Temple. Jones's new church attracted only 20 members who had come with him from the Laurel Street Tabernacle and was not ready to financially support his vision. Jones saw a need for publicity and began seeking a way to popularize his ministry and recruit members. Jones began to closely associate with the Independent Assemblies of God, an international group of churches which embraced the Latter Rain movement. The IAOG had few re requirements for ordaining ministers, and they were also accepting of divine healing practices. In June 1955, Jones held his first joint meetings with William Branham, a healing evangelist, and Pentecostal leader in the Globing Healing Revival. In 1956, Jones was ordained as an IAOG minister by Joseph Matson Bowes, a leader in the Latter Rain Movement and the IAOG. Jones quickly rose to prominence in the group and organized and hosted a healing convention to take place June 11th through 15th, 1956 in Indianapolis's Cattle Tabernacle. Needing a well-known figure to draw crowds, he arranged to share the pulpit again with Broadham. Jones and his wife made a point of adopting several non-white children. Jones referred to his household as a rainbow family and stated, integration is a more personal thing with me now. It's a question of my son's future. He also portrayed the temple as a rainbow family. In 1954, the Joneses adopted their first child, Agnes, who was part Native American. In 1959, they adopted three Korean American children named Lou, Stephanie, and Suzanne and encouraged temple members to adopt orphans from war-ravaged Korea. Stephanie Jones died at the age of five in a car accident in May of 1959. In June 1959, Jones and his wife had their only biological child, baby Hib Stephan Gandhi. In 1961, they became the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child. They became Jim Jones Jr. or James W. Jones Jr. They adopted a white son, originally named Timothy Glenn Tupper, shortened to Tim, whose birth mother was a member of the temple. Jones father, Jim John Kimmo, with temple member Carolyn Layton. In 1961, Jones warned his congregation that he had received visions of a nuclear attack that would devastate Indianapolis. His wife confided to her friends that he was becoming increasingly paranoid and fearful. Like other followers of William Branham, who moved to South America during the 1960s, Jones may have been influenced by Branham's 1961 prophecy concerning the destruction of the United States in a nuclear war. Jones began to look for a way to escape the destruction he believed was evident. In January 1962, he read an Esquire magazine article, The Pur 
purported South America to be the safest place to reside to escape any impending nuclear war. <laughs> Don't know if that article actually existed or if that was just, you know, in his head. I, I, I can't tell you that. Um, I was not able to find any evidence of said article. Jones decided to travel to South America to scout for a site to relocate pimp People's Temple. Jones made a stop in Georgetown, Guana, on his way to Brazil. Jones held revival meetings in Guana, which was an English-speaking British colony continuing to Brazil. Jones's family rented a modest three-bedroom home in Belo Horizonte. Jones has studied the local economy and receptiveness of racial minorities to his message, but found language to be a barrier. Careful not to portray himself as communist, he spoke of an apostol apostolic, apostolic communal lifestyle rather than Marxism. The family moved to Rio de Janeiro in mid-1963 when they worked with the poor and the, favela the favelas. Unable to find a location he deemed suitable for People's Temple, Jones became plagued by guilt for abandoning the civil rights struggle in Indiana. During the year of his absence, regular attendance at People's Temple declined to less than 100. Jones demanded the People's Temple send all its revenue to him in South America to support his efforts, and the church went into debt to support his mission. In late 1963, Archie... I. James sent word that the temple was about to collapse and threatened to resign if Jones did not return soon. Jones reluctantly returned to Indiana. Jones arrived in December 1963 to find People's Temple bitterly divided. Financial issues and low attendance forced Jones to sell the People's Temple church building and relocate to a smaller building nearby. To raise money, Jones briefly returned to the revival circuit, traveling and holding healing campaigns with latter rain groups. Possibly to distract People's Temple members from the issues facing their group, he told his Indiana congregation that the world would be engulfed by nuclear war on July 15, 1967, leading to a new socialist Eden on Earth, and that the temple must move to Northern California for safety. During 1964, Jones made multiple trips to California to find a suitable location to relocate. In July 1965, Jones and his family and his followers, began moving to their new location in Redwood Valley, California, near the city of Utah, of Yukia. <laughs> Russell Winberg, People's Temple's assistant pastor, strongly resisted Jones's efforts to move the congregation and warned members that Jones was abandoned in Christianity. Winberg took over leadership of the Indianapolis church when Jones departed. About 140 of Jones' most loyal followers made the move to California while the rest remained behind with Winberg. In California, Jones took a job as a history and government teacher at an adult education school in Yukia. Jones used his position to recruit for People's Temple, teaching his students the benefits of Marxism and lecturing on religion. Jones planted loyal members of People's Temple in the classes to help him with recruitment. Jones recruited 50 new members to People's Temple in the first few months. In 1967, Jones's followers coaxed another 75 members of the Indianapolis congregation to move to California. In 1968, the People's Temple... Temple's California location was admitted to the Disciples of Christ. Joan began to use a denominational connection to promote People's Temple as part of the 1.5 million member denomination. He played up famous members of the Disciples, including Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover, and misrepresented the nature of his position in the denomination. By 1969, Jones increased the membership of People's Temple in California to 300. Jones increasingly promoted the idea of his own divinity, going so far as to tell his congregation that, quote, I am come as God's socialist, end quote. Jones carefully avoided claiming divinity outside of people's temple, but he expected to be acknowledged as godlike among his followers. Former temple member Hugh Fortson Jr. quoted him as saying, quote, what you need to believe in is what you can see. If you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. If, as you see me as your father, I'll be your father. For those of you that don't have a father. If you see me as a savior, I'll be your savior. If you see me as your God, I'll be your God. End quote. Jones began using illicit drugs after moving to California, which further heightened his paranoia. He increasingly used fear to control and manipulate his followers. Jones frequently warned his followers that there was an enemy seeking to destroy them. The identity of that enemy changed over time from the Ku Klux Klan to Nazis to redneck vigilantes and finally the American government. He frequently prophesied that fires, car accidents, and death or injury would come upon anyone unfaithful to him and his teachings. He constantly pressed his followers to be aggressive in promoting and fulfilling these beliefs. 
Jones established a planning commission made up of lieutenants to direct the People's Temple's communal lifestyles. Jones, through the planning commission, began controlling all aspects of the lives of his followers. Members who joined People's Temple turned over all their assets to the church in exchange for free room and board. Members who worked outside of the temple turned over their income to be used for the benefit of the community. Jones directed groups of his followers to work on various projects for additional income and set up an agricultural organization operation in Redwood Valley to grow food. Um, Jones I'm having trouble breathing, sorry. Jones began to receive negative press beginning in October 1971 when reporters covered one of Jones' divine healing services during a visit to his old church in Indianapolis. The news report led to an investigation by the Indiana State Psychology Board into Jones' healing practices in 1972. A doctor involved in the investigation accused Jones of quackery and challenged Jones to give tissue samples of the material he claimed fell off people when they were healed of cancer. The investigation caused alarm within the temple. Jones had been performing faith healing miracles since his joint campaigns with William Branham. On several occasions, his healings were revealed as nothing but a hoax. In one incident, Jones drugged Temple member Irene Mason, and while she was unconscious, a cast was put on her arm. When she regained consciousness, she was told she had fallen and broken her arm and taken to the hospital. In a subsequent healing service, Jones removed her cast off in front of the congregation and told them she was healed. In other instances, Jones had someone from his inner circle enter the prayer line for healing of cancer. After being healed, the person would pretend to cough up their tumor, which was actually a chicken gizzard. Jones also pretended to have special revelations about individuals which revealed supposed hidden details of their lives. Jones had co-workers who called at the potential recruits' homes and asked detailed questions in the cover of doing an unrelated examination. This provided Jones with inside information that would make him seem clairvoyant and being in possession of superhuman powers. Jones was fearful that his methods would be exposed by the investigation. In response, Jones announced he was terminating his ministry in Indiana because it was too far from California for him to attend to and downplayed his healing claims to the authorities. The issue only escalated, however, and Lester Kinsolving ran a series of articles targeting Jones at People's Temple and the San Francisco Examiner in September 1972. The stories reported on Jones's claims of divinity and exposed purported miracles as a hoax. On December 13, 1973, Jones was arrested and charged with lewd conduct for allegedly masturbating in the presence of a male undercover LAPD off vice officer in a movie theater restroom near Los Angeles' MacArthur Park. On December 20th, 1973, the charges against Jones were dismissed, though the details of the dismissal are not clear. The court file was sealed and the judge ordered that records of the arrest be destroyed. Um... Sorry, Jones left I. James to oversee Jonestown while he returned to the United States to continue his efforts to combat the negative press. He was largely unsuccessful, and more stories of abuse in People's Temple were leaked to the public. In March 1977, Marshall Kildoff, Kildoff published a story in U.S. Magazine exposing abuses at the People's Temple. The article included allegations by Temple defectors of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. The article convinced Jones that it was time to permanently relocate to South America, and when he began to compel members of People's Temple to make the move with him. Jones promoted the commune as a means to create both a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from the media scrutiny in San Francisco. Jones purported to establish it as a model communist community, adding that the temple comprised the purest communists there are. Once they arrived in Jonestown, Jones prevented members from leaving the settlement. Entertaining movies from Georgetown that the settlers had watched were mostly canceled in favor of Soviet propaganda shorts and documentaries on American social problems. Lessons on Soviet affiliations, Jones's crises, and the alleged mercenaries dispatched by Tom Stowen, who had defected from the temple and turned against the group, were the topic of adult midnight lectures and classroom discussions of Jones's discourses about revolution and adversaries. Jonestown had about 50 settlers at the start of 1977 who were expanding the commune, but it was not ready to handle a large influx of settlers. Bureaucratic requirements after Jones's arrival sapped labor resources for other needs. Buildings fell into disrepair and weeds that crushed out fields. IJF warned Jones that the facilities could only support 200 people, but Jones believed the need to relocate was urgent and determined to move immediately.
In November 1978, Congressman Ryan led a fact-finding mission to Jonestown to investigate allegations of human rights abuses. His delegation included relatives of Temple members, an NBC camera crew, and reporters for several newspapers. The group arrived in the Guyanese capital of Georgetown on November 15th. Two days later, they traveled by airplane to Port Kayotuma, then were transported to Jonestown. Jones hosted a reception for the delegation that evening at the Central Pavilion of Jonestown, during which Temple member Vernon Gosney passed a note meant for Ryan to NBC reporter Don Harris, requesting assistance for himself and another Temple member, Monica Bagby, in leaving the settlement. Tensions began to rise as news spread through the community that some members were attempting to leave. Ryan's delegation left hurriedly in the afternoon of November 18th after Ryan narrowly avoided being stabbed by Temple member Don Sly. Ryan and his delegation managed to take along 15 Temple members who expressed a desire to leave, and Jones made no attempt to prevent their departure at that time. Marceline Jones announced on the public address system that everything was fine and urged locals to go back to their houses after Ryan left Jamestown for Port Kayatuma. During this time, aides prepared a large metal tub with great flavor aid, poisoned with diphen. These are gonna get me. Diphenhydramine, promethazine, chlorpromazine, chloroquin, chloral hydrate, diazepam, and cyanide. As members of Ryan's delegation boarded two planes at the Port Kayatuma airstrip. Jonestown Red Brigade of Armed Guards arrived and began shooting at them. The gunmen killed Ryan and four others near Guyana Airways Twin Otter aircraft. At the same time, one of the supposed defectors, Larry Layton, drew a weapon and began firing on members of the party inside the other plane, a Cessna, which included Gosney and Bagby. NBC cameraman Bob Brown was able to capture footage of the first few seconds of the shooting at the Otter just before he himself was killed by the gunmen. The five killed at the airstrip were Ryan Harris, were Ryan Harris Brown, San Francisco Examiner photographer Greg Robinson, and Temple member Patricia Parks. Surviving the attack were future Congresswoman Jackie Spear, a Ryan staff member, Richard Dwyer, Deputy Chief of Mission from the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown, Bob Flick, an NBC producer, Steve Sung, an NBC sound engineer, Tim Reederman, an Examiner reporter. Ron Javers, a Chronicle reporter, Charles Krauss, a Washington Post reporter, and several defecting Temple members. They escaped into the jungle to avoid being killed. Later the same day, November 18th, 1978, Jones received word that his security guards failed to kill all of Ryan's party. Jones concluded the escapees would soon inform the United States of the attack and they would send the military to seize Jonestown. Jones called the entire community to the Central Pavilion. He informed the community that Ryan was dead and it was only a matter of time before military commandos to send another cop unit killed them all. Jones told Temple murders that the Soviet Union would not give them passage after the airstrip shooting. Jones said, we can check with Russia to see if they'll take us in immediately, otherwise we'll die. Asking, you think Russia's going to want us with all this stigma? With that reasoning, Jones and several members argued the group should commit revolutionary suicide. Jones required the entire death ritual, recorded the entire death ritual on audio tape. One Temple member, Christine Miller, dissented towards the beginning of the tape. Cries and screams of children and adults were also easily heard on the tape recording made. The Temple had received monthly half-pound shipments of cyanide since 1976 after Jones obtained a jeweler's half-pound shipments of cyanide. Uh, obtained a jeweler's license to buy the chemical purportedly to clean gold. And in May 1978, a temple doctor wrote a memo to Jones asking permission to test cyanide on Jonestown pigs as their metabolism was close to that of human beings. A drink mixture of flavor aid and cyanide was handed out to the members of the community to drink. Those who refused to drink were injected with cyanide via syringe. The crowd was also surrounded by armed guards, offering members the basic dilemma of death by poison or death by a guard's hand. Rilana Paul and her one-year-old child were the first to consume the poison, according to escaped Temple member Odell Rhodes. The child's mouth was filled with poison using a syringe without a needle, and Paul then injected more poison into her own mouth. According to Rhodes, after ingesting the poison, people were taken down a wooden walkway that led outside the pavilion. As parents watched their children perish for the poison, Rhodes described a scene of panic and confusion. He added that many of the assembled temple members walked around like they were in a trance, and that the majority quietly waited for their own turn to die. Over time, as more temple members perished, the guards themselves were called in to die by poison. It's not clear if some initially thought the exercise was another white night rehearsal. 
When members wept and showed signs of dissent, Jones counseled to stop these hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialists or communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. Jones can be heard saying, don't be afraid to die, adding that death is just stepping over into another plane and adding that death is a friend. Jones directed that the children be killed first. His wife, Marceline, apparently protested against killing the tree children. She was forcibly restrained and then joined the other adults in poisoning herself after the children had died. At the end of the tape, Jones concludes, We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. In the early evening of November 18th, Temple member Sharon Amos in Georgetown received a radio message from Jonestown telling the members there to exact a vengeance on the Temple's foes before committing a revolutionary, su su revolutionary suicide. Later, after police arrived at the headquarters, Sharon escorted her children, Leanne, Krista, and Martin into a bathroom. Wielding a kitchen knife, Sharon first killed Krista and then Martin. Then Leanne assisted Sharon in cutting her own throat, after which Leanne killed herself. 85 members of the community survived the event. Some slipped into the jungle just as the death ritual began. One man hid in a ditch. One elderly woman hid in her dormitory and slept through the event, awaking to find everyone dead. Three high-ranking temple survivors claimed they were given an assignment and thereby escaped death. The Jonestown basketball team was away at a game and survived. Others hid in the dormitories or were away from the community on business when the death ritual unfolded. Survivor Tim Carter has suggested that, like a previous practice, that day's lunch of grilled cheese sandwiches may have been tainted with sedatives to subdue members of the cult. Furthermore, in a 2007 interview with forensic psychiatrist Dr. Michael H. Stone, for the program Most Evil, Carter stated his belief that Jones had his guards pose the dead bodies of the Jonestown residents to make it appear that more people had willingly committed suicide. The mass murder-suicide resulted in the deaths of 909 inhabitants of Jonestown, 276 of them children, mostly in and around the Central Pavilion. This resulted in the greatest single loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act until September 11, 2001. Another four members residing in Georgetown died. The FBI later recovered the 45-minute audio recording of the mass poisoning of progress. The recording became known as the death tape. Jones' three sons, Stephen, Jim Jr., and Tim Jones, were with the People's Temple basketball team in Georgetown at the time of the mass poisoning. During the events at George Jonestown, the three brothers drove to the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown to alert the authorities. Guyanese soldiers guarding the embassy refused to let them in after hearing about the shootings at the Port Kaituma airstrip. Later, the three returned to the temple's headquarters in Georgetown to find the bodies of Sharon Amos and her three children, Leanne, Krista, and Martin. The Guyanese military arrived in Jonestown to find the dead. The United States military organized an airlift to bring the remains back to the United States to be buried. Jones was found dead on the stage of the Central Pavilion. He was resting on a pillow near his deck chair with a gunshot wound to his head. Jones' body was later moved for examination and embalming. The official autopsy conducted by Guyanese coroner Serial Mutu in December 1978 confirmed Jones's cause of death as suicide. His son Stephen Stephen speculated that his father may have directed someone else to shoot him. The autopsy showed high levels of the barbiturate pinto bar, bar barbital. I can never say that one. In Jones's body, which may have been lethal to humans who had not developed psychological tolerance. Jones's body was cremated and his remains were scattered in the Atlantic Ocean. Guyanese soldiers kept the Jonestown's brothers under house arrest for five days, interrogating them about the deaths in Georgetown. Stefan, Stefan was accused of involvement in the deaths and placed in a Guyanese prison for three months. Tim and Johnny Cobb, other members of the Temple basketball team, were taken to Jonestown to identify bodies. After returning to the U.S., Jim Jones Jr. was placed under police surveillance for several months while he lived with his older sister, Suzanne, who had previously turned against the temple. Members of Jones's family, including his wife, four children, and their spouses, and five grandchildren, died in Jonestown. John Victor Stowen died in Jonestown. His body was found just outside of Jones' house. Jones's house. In a signed note found at the time of her death, Marceline directed that Jones's assets to be given be given to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The People's Temple Secretary had already made arrangements for seven point three million dollars, twenty nine million and twenty twenty dollars, in temple funds to be transferred to the Soviet Embassy in Guyana. Most of the money was held in foreign bank accounts and was transferred electronically, but six hundred and eighty thousand two million nine hundred and four thousand ninety seven dollars and twenty twenty dollars was held in cash and three couriers were hired to transport the cash to the Soviets. The couriers were arrested before reaching their destination and claimed to have hidden most of the money. 
The events at Jonestown were immediately subject to extensive media contra- coverage and became known as the Jonestown Massacre. As awareness reached the public, outsiders refused to accept Jones's attempt to blame them for the deaths. Critics and apologists offered a variety of explanations for the events that transpired among Jones's followers. The Soviet Union publicly distanced itself from Jones in what they called this bastardization of the concept of revolutionary suicide. American Christian leaders denounced Jones as satanic and asserted that he and his teachings were in no way connected to traditional Christianity. And in an article entitled On Satan in Jonestown, Billy Graham argued that it could be a mistake to identify Jones and his cult as Christian. Graham was joined by other prominent Christian leaders in alleging that Jones was demonically possessed. Disciples of Christ responded to the Jonestown deaths with significant changes for many ministerial ethics and a new process to remove ministers. The disciples issued a press release disavowing Jones and reported that the community in Jonestown was not affiliated with their denomination. They subsequently expelled People's Temple from their denomination. In the immediate aftermath, rumors arose that surviving members of People's Temple in San Francisco were organizing hit squads to target critics and enemies of the church. Law enforcement intervened to protect the media and other figures who were purported to be targeted. People's Temple San Francisco headquarters was besieged by the media, angry protesters, and family members of the dead. I. James, who returned from Jonestown to take leadership in San Francisco earlier in 1978, was left to address the public. At first, he denied that Jones had any connection to the deaths and alleged the events were a plot by enemies of the church, but later acknowledged the truth. Since the Jonestown Massacre, a massive amount of literature and study has been produced on the subject. Numerous documentaries, films, books, poetry, music, and art have covered or been inspired by the events of Jonestown. Jim Jones and the events of Jonestown had a defining influence on society's perception of cults. The widely known expression, drinking the Kool-Aid, developed after the events of Jonestown, although the specific beverage used at the massacre was flavor aid. And that is the story of Jim Jones. Jim, Jim. It's a lot of J's. Jim Jones, Jonestown, and the People's Temple. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you for hanging out with me. As always, please no cult shaming or um, victim blaming of any kind in the comments. Um, just, we don't do that here and you will be removed from the channel immediately. Um, as always, please be cautiously kind to others. Don't do anything I wouldn't do and make good choices. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye.